Welcome to St. Louis Presents. Yes, Raina, and welcome to you too. Thank you. Thanks so much for filling in for Debbie Monterey today. I am happy to be here. You know, I feel like I sort of know you. <laughs> you do really, sort of know me. But I don't me. really know you. I know, we've, we were just talking about this. We've been working together at the station for years now. I've been here 13 years. More like 16 for me, I think. See, and we've never had the opportunity to work together on the set before. Well, we've done different projects and we're here at different times of day. So anyway, it's nice to sit down with it's you. It's very nice to be maybe here Maybe this will lead to something bigger for both of us. Oh, well, I guess we'll see at the end of the show, right? <laughs> right. We'll know at the end of the show. <laughs> hey, we've got some really interesting things to talk about today. And I don't know about you, but I've always had a really soft uh, spot in my heart for Tower Grove Park. They're celebrating 150 years. We're going to talk to their executive director about some kind of long term. We're in the process of of gathering information and input from the public for long-term plans to make it even better. I love that park, so I'm excited about right. that one. And then we're going to talk to Lisa Voss from Brendan's Friday Backpacks, which is an organization that's doing its part to stamp out hunger right here at home in the St. Louis area. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good work. Yeah. And there's this group called the Humans of St. Louis, which I wasn't familiar with until just the other day. And what they do is they really just walk up to strangers, basically, um, on the street. I like it already. Yeah. <laughs> you can see them better. They take their picture and then they ask them certain questions and then they share that information and it just uh, leads to a lot of discussion and it's an interesting concept. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Well, all of that and more is coming up next on St. Louis Presents. Tower Grove Park was first authorized by a state law passed 150 years ago. Today it's among Missouri's great places for 2017. And as the park is being recognized for its exceptional character, quality, and planning, it's also actively planning for the next 150 years. Joining us now is the park's director, Bill Reininger. Thanks for having me. Oh, now, Bill, honor. you haven't been there the whole 150 years. Have no, you? I have not. <laughs> not 18 gonna, months. Because you look really <laughs> young. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. You know, so tell us about the history of Targrove Park. I mean, how we know it's been there for 150 years, but it's really transformed over the years. And we know that it was... Um, one of the first places that people, people could travel to out in the country from the city of St. Louis years ago. Yeah, when Henry Shaw donated the land to the, to the city, it was actually outside of the city limits at the time. Uh, Grand Avenue was the city boundaries, which is why the uh, state legislature had to do the ordinance in order for it to city, be a city park. But Henry Shaw, through his travels in Europe, really saw that uh, city parks were starting to take hold. Uh, prior to that, they really weren't that uh, common and he wanted to help raise the cultural awareness in the city of St. Louis. So that's why he really focused in on the Botanical Gardens and Tower Grove Park so that people would have a place to go and learn and rest. And, you know, parks are really the, the lungs of a city. So that's why he really wanted to establish it. Because that originally was his estate, his country estate kind of, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and that was all farm ground around that area. So it was really visionary to think that eventually the city would be all the way out there and that people would need that opportunity. Right, and a bit of trivia, isn't this right? I mean, after Forest Park, Tower Grove Park would be the largest park in the city, and after Tower Grove Park, I mean, there's nothing really even near that big after it, right? Correct. Uh, Tower Grove Park is 289 acres, so it is the second largest and the third oldest. It was uh, established as the first driving park, carriage, not car, <laughs> at the time, so it was uh, ahead of its time. At, and you're, you're just getting an award this year. So let's talk about that award, because it's pretty amazing. Yeah, we're very excited. The Missouri chapter of the uh, America's Plan American Planning Society, uh, America's Planning Association named us one of Missouri's best places. So we competed against a bunch of other places around the city and because, around the state, and because of our unique nature, how we uh, bring folks from different cultures together, the historic nature of the park with our pavilions, and then all the different events that happen in the park from Food Truck Fridays 
Farmers Market, Festival of Nations, it really stood out. So we're really honored to be able to I get that award. I love those food truck Fridays, by the way. That's really good. Well, I guess since, Bill, since you won this award, your job's done, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm retiring next month. <laughs> I don't know. He told me something about planning for this big 150th celebration. Yeah, you, you're really looking for public input, though, right? We are. We're doing a master plan. With the 150th coming up uh, in a couple of years, we wanted to make sure that the park is as beautiful for the next 150. So we're starting to take uh, action now with the master plan, which will guide the park for the next 20 to 30 years. And we hired a firm, uh, Roadside and Harwell, and they're leading those efforts. So right now we're in the gathering uh, phase of that. We had a public meeting uh, in the Piper Palm House, and we had over 200 people come and share their ideas and stories and wants and desires for the park, which was great. And then we did an online survey as well, and we were hoping for about 500 folks to, to weigh in on that and we had almost 1300. It sounds like maybe this park means something to the people around here. Yeah and we always had that uh, feeling but I think just the number of people are showing up and the the feedback that we're getting of you know how much they love it and use it uh, and how they want to keep it maintained has really been energizing for us as Right, as I'm glad you brought that up with what me I'm just gonna throw my two cents in. It means <laughs> something to me. I mean my uh, mother's family was living one block off the park on holiday when she was born so you know Wow. And I, I bet you bump into people every day that have a story like that. Yeah, and including myself. My grandparents lived on Arsenal right across from the park, and I've seen family photos from the 1950s of family picnics in the park. So it, it's, you know, within my heart as well, so it's great to have that opportunity to be well, part of it. And you know what's interesting? Even though the park is in the city, I mean, it's just this amazing acreage right in the middle of the city. You have people who come from all over. It's not just people in walking distance that really utilize this park. And the Victorian and feel it. of it, I think, is what kind of makes it unique. Yeah, it, it is definitely a neighborhood park, regional as well, but it has uh, international and national as implications as well. Well, I know you don't have any definite plans yet, but you're getting all this input from people. What Do you have any idea what some of the projects might be? Do you have any general ideas? Um, we're getting uh, just some general feedback. A lot of it is um, they love the park the way it is. They don't, you know, don't mess it up. Uh, <laughs> so they want to keep it that, that quaint neighborhood feel. I think a lot of folks just want to see us make sure that we're continuing to maintain it. And I think we'll get some new ideas for uh, new recreational activities. 20 years ago, you know, who would have thought that kickball was such going to be such a prominent sport within the park? Uh, frisbee golf, perhaps, you know, uh, disc golf, uh, frisbee, you know, there's just so many different new things that are coming up. Uh, that's why we want to make sure we're addressing those needs as we move forward. And tell me about the, the gentleman you replaced, John Carroll. You've been in, on the job, I guess, about a year and a half or something. But um, maybe we should give him a shout out because he had your job for how long? 27 years. Wow. So I, I get to say, and he was a tall man, he was about 6'4", I get to stand on his <laughs> shoulders uh, because, you know, he took, o took over in the 1980s when there was a lot of deferred maintenance within a lot of city parks across the, the country. And he elevated to where it is today, which is now allowing us to continue to build on uh, and make it even better. So you're just looking for more feedback, right? What should people more do feedback. if they have an idea? Um, right now they're taking all that information that they gathered, they're creating a couple different options and we'll be having more public meetings in the next couple months uh, to get feedback on those different options. So we're excited about that and we're really excited about spring, get folks back out in the park. We have some new uh, experiential education things that are out there. Last year we established a couple savannas, some riparian zones, so there'll be a lot more nature in the park. Well, okay, you'll have to uh, fill me in some other time then. I would love to. Hey, in the meantime, though, for people that want to know more about the park or if they want to give you input on some of these future plans, uh, they can go to your website, www.towergrovepark.org. Correct. Right. Thank you so much for being with us today, Bill. We'll be back with more St. Louis Presents right after this. Thanks. Thank you. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov.
G morning, sunshine. Wakey, wakey. Text me. Are your parents home later? We can hang. L-U-V, love you. JK. Holla back. Holla back. Holla back. <laughs> Are you with your friends? That's lame. We're in a huge fight right now. XO. What'd you dream of? Something I did? Are you on your way to the mall? I'm lonely. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. Welcome back. Joining me now is Lisa Voss. She's a volunteer for Brendan's Friday Backpack, an organization dedicated to helping hungry children. And I know Brendan's Friday Backpack started as a Boy Scout project. It did. Um, uh, back in 2011, Vicki Tamboli and her son, Brendan, their family, they were traveling in the Smoky Mountains and they heard a radio ad for a similar program. Uh, and they were very interested in that. They came back to um, Jefferson County, Missouri after their vacation and um, did a little research and they found out that nothing like that existed in the area. So they moved forward with starting a program in our area. And what the program does, I'll let you tell it, is make sure that hungry children get something to eat. Um, yes, our mission is helping hungry kids eat over the weekends. And um, what we do is we work through the school system and um, make sure that kids um, that have something called food insecurities, um, that they have food over the weekends. Um, most of these kids do pretty well during the week, um, having school breakfast and school lunch available to them. But over the weekends, they're not sure if there's going to be food in their pantries. And we make sure that on Friday, they go home with some food. Is that really an issue here in the St. Louis area? This is an issue. Um, this is definitely an issue and it can happen for many different reasons. Um, families struggle um, financially or just other personal struggles that parents are going through where it makes it difficult for them to provide um, food for their children. You know what I really like about this? This is something local that people can do to really make a difference and it doesn't take a lot to be a part of this and help make a difference. No, we are um, very much supported by our community. Um, we have churches that donate food, um, scout troops, um, small businesses, um, civic organizations. So we are very much supported by our community and a team of small volunteer, or small team of volunteers. And you know, you and I were talking beforehand and you said something that I thought was really interesting. This is what's happening in Jefferson County, but this can, you can help people get this type of thing set up in whatever their community is to make a difference there too. Sure, anyone that has um, a heart for children can, can figure out you know, a program like this, maybe starting small with um, one school um, and you know, maybe an organization like a church or um, a civic organization to, to get donations going and start small and, and, and you know, make a difference in your area. So how does it work? How do you know which child is going, maybe is at risk for being hungry over the weekend so you know who to give that backpack to? How do you figure that out? Um, we work through the school system. So we have contact with um, counselors and in social workers inside um, the schools. And um, any of those schools that we work with, they can, um, the counselors can contact us and make sure that we get a bag to these kids. Um, the kids are anonymous to us. It is done through the school. Um, Fridays, they go home with a bag of food to get them through the weekend in their backpack. So basically, you put the food together, then you get it into the hands of the school. So you really have no connection with those kids. Therefore, the kids won't feel embarrassed like they're getting a handout or anything like that. Correct, correct. We have uh, volunteers that get together on Tuesdays at a storage facility and we take the donations and pack the bags assembly line style, um, sort donations and things like that. Um, on Thursdays, some of our volunteers uh, go out and go to the schools and get those bags to the counselors and then they're distributed on Friday to the children. And you've only been doing this for how many years? Um, the program has been going since 2011. So. Well, I'm asking that because that's a really short amount of time and you reach a tremendous amount of students. So talk about how many schools you, you serve and how many children actually benefit from what you're doing. Uh, we are currently in 54 individual schools. Um, that is nine school districts in Jefferson County and Northern St. Francis County and we are serving over 1,200 children a week. 
I'm sorry, did you say over 1,200 children in just one district? Um, no, that is the whole, the nine school districts okay. and um, the 54 schools. So. How, how close to home is this? This is very close to home and that's um, part of what um, keeps me going and volunteering with this group. Um, you just don't realize how close hunger is to you and um, these are kids down the street. These are kids that are sitting next to my children in class. Um, you know, I deliver backpacks to the school where my children go. So you just don't realize it. It can be a very quiet issue and um, it's, it's closer than you think. It's really a simple thing that somebody can do to make a difference. So how, how would one help? What would we do? Um, we are always uh, happy to take food donations, monetary donations, and um, we do fundraisers. Um, we have a trivia night coming up uh, in April, so um, those are some ways to help. And if somebody wants to do a little bit more than just donating some money, some time, or some food, they really want to impact their community or another community, what do they do? I would say go to your local school and check in with the school counselors or the principals and, and see if this uh, could be something that would be helpful in that school. Wonderful. So one more time, it's called Brendan. Brendan's Friday Backpack. And anybody can contribute, but anybody can get this started in their community too. Sure. Most definitely. Thank you so much. Here was something interesting is Steve. Thanks, Raina. Since the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency has committed to build a new campus on the city's near north side, work has begun to clean and clear the 97-acre site. The city has begun the process to relocate residents, move remaining businesses, remove utilities, vacate streets, demolish structures, clear debris, and regrade the site. Part of this process includes physically moving the home of one Ms. Taylor to a new location less than a mile away. Mayor Slay said, and I quote, Ms. Taylor, along with several of her neighbors who have wished to relocate in the immediate vicinity of the NGA site, will benefit from the catalytic economic impact the NGA is expected to create." Unquote. Attorney Aaron Banks has been nominated by Mayor Slay as the newest member of the city's Civilian Oversight Board. As a candidate for District 4, Banks will be representing Wards 7, 8, 9, and 17. The Citizen, Citizens Board is responsible for independently receiving and reviewing complaints against the city's police department. Before Banks may hear cases, the Board of Aldermen must confirm his nomination and he must complete training at the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department Citizens Academy. It's that time of year again and the St. Louis chapter of the National Association of Black Accountants is teaming up with several community partners, including Comptroller Green's office, to provide free tax assistance and bank consultation to low to moderate income earners, the elderly, and to disabled taxpayers. If you're in need of assistance, you can find out more information by calling 314-657-3422, or you can visit them online at naba-stl.org slash VITA. And the St. Louis Auto Show recently returned, and STL TV's Angela Sharp was there to check out the latest and greatest in automobiles. And while she was there, she caught up with fan favorite champion drifter Von Gittin Jr. Let's take a look. All right, it's one of my favorite aspects of the St. Louis Auto Show. Von Gittin Jr., you were here, I think every time I've been here, out here drifting for the fans. Why do you like coming to the St. Louis Auto Show? Well, we've been coming here, I think, five or six years now. and. Uh, it's just a blast like the whole auto show crew is fun to work with and the fans here in st louis have been amazing and this year has been such a realization for me you know kids are coming up to me and they're you know 10 or 12 now but they were six you know their parents set them on the roof of the car so it's a really cool vibe out here and uh everyone gets excited and i live off other people's energy and there's plenty of it yeah well, i mean you have a lot of energy which i like i guess you have to what made you want to get started drifting uh, i've just always loved cars you know i've grown up skateboarding bmx racing motocross but to my core I just loved cars and uh, I just kind of fell into it you know I, I fell in love with the culture and uh, the uh, the scene around the sport the people involved in it and really just became a dream that I chased and uh, worked really hard to, to get where we're at now. All right, so how many tires do you go through on an event like today? Yeah so out here we have a brand new Ford Mustang RTRs that we're driving 
uh, we'll go through a pair of tires each car each session. So about 15 minutes. Um, I think we probably bought brought about 40 to 50 tires per car. So just to put that in perspective, if we went through 100 tires this weekend, each tire is roughly 35,000 miles for the average person. That's about uh, what 3.5 million miles that we're going to go through in tires uh, this year so, or this weekend. This weekend. Uh, and at Formula Drift, you know, we get literally two laps on our tires. You know, we're, we're traveling with, you know, 130, 140 mile an hour wheel speed at between 80 and 100 miles an hour. So the Ditto tires that we use handle it very well, but, uh, you know, there's only so long they can last through, through the temperatures and through the amount of, of spinning that they go through. Wow, Raina, did you see that driving? It looks like me going to work. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> kind oh, of a little bit. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Joining us now is one of the co-founders and lead storytellers of Humans of St. Louis. Inspired by Humans of New York, this group aims to share first-person stories and portraits of the people of St. Louis, one St. Louisan at a time. Lindy True, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me. I gotta tell you, I love what you're doing. Thank you. You know, I'd never heard of this idea. You've only been doing this in St. Louis, I guess, a couple of years, right? Yeah, it'll be year three this year on Cinco de Mayo. I'm but it, of May. Go ahead. Good, I was gonna say, but it started in New York. Yeah, technically it did. So Brandon Stanton is a photographer that started Humans of New York, which is known as Honey, uh, years ago. And now he's got about 19 million followers. And since then, the Humans of Movement has grown to over 300 Humans of pages around the world. It's a really interesting concept. So what you basically do, and you do this yourself, and I guess other people yes. do too, you'll just be walking down the street somewhere with uh, your camera, and you find someone that, I guess, gets your attention for one reason or another, and you just walk up to them, and what do you say? Yeah, so I just, I'm usually on my bike when the weather's that nice out, and I'll have my camera across my body, and I just walk up to strangers. I introduce myself. Um, I tell them what the premise is behind the project and ask if I can take their photo and ask them a few questions about life, love, St. Louis, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's not the person, sometimes it's the shoes. Oh, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was telling her earlier that yeah. um, I don't usually look for people based on what they look like. It's not your size, your religion, your color. It's more who has the opportunity and the time to give, to have a, a conversation and to get vulnerable in those five minutes or sometimes 30 minutes that we'll have on the street. And Raina mentioned the shoes because um, you just saw some woman's shoes and that's what attracted you to her. Yeah, so I was on Del Mar and it was kind of a slow day and I thought the next person I see I'm gonna approach. So this lady had her legs crossed, I saw her shoes. Um, she was at a bus stop and I walked over to her to ask if I could interview her. She said, yeah, no problem. So we talked for about 10 minutes and a, a friend of mine who I was in um, school with for social work and public health had asked, the next time you go out, can you ask somebody this question? So the question I asked this lady was, if there's one pain or hurt that you could get rid of, what would it be and why? She thought about it and she told me that her son had died about 10 years ago of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. And she got a note from the coroner and the coroner told her, I'm very sorry for your loss, but just know that in no way is this your fault. So it's like, what do you do with that? So we put that piece together with a photo and, and her quote on the site, and it gives people an opportunity to then have a conversation. Yeah, about I just it. want to bring out the point that after you take a picture and interview them, you, you share it, and then people look at it and respond to it and interact with each other about what they've seen. Yeah, exactly. And so the real magic happens not necessarily during the interview, it's only half of the process. The other half is then kind of like collaborating with that subject to say, is it okay now that we put this on our site? And once we post it, then people start to chime in. So right now we have about 84,000 followers on the page and they jump in with their likes and their comments and they get the commentary going about things. They offer resources, they offer help for people, they extend a helping hand in some instances. 84,000 followers. I know, mm -hmm. that was, that was um, what I was going to ask. Like what, is you, what was your hope when you would post and, this? And we're, and we're looking at somebody now, maybe you want to jump in oh, and say yeah. something. Oh yeah, um, the hope originally when we posted it was that we really wanted to um, share what people were thinking on the, on the streets of St. Louis. Well, so this, looking example, at right now? this for example is Amos and he has a business where he sells bikes, used bikes. He gets them really cheaply and he was on um, in his car one day and he went to turn the corner and a girl popped her chain on her bicycle 
And so he almost hit her in his car. <laughs> he got out of the car instead. He helped her fix her bike. And he had this idea. He thought, you know, I could sell bikes to kids after I fix them and make a little money. I don't have a brick and mortar business, but this will be kind of my, you know, entrepreneurial spirit to do something. And so he ended up getting this bike shop and um, he just runs it outside of uh, Flea Market in Pagedale and people come over and buy his bikes cheaply. Now the cool thing about Amos is he told the kids in the neighborhood, if you get a C on your report card and you bump it up to a B next time, or a B to an A or whatnot, you can choose any bike you want off the lot for free. So he said, you know, the community, they won't get rid of me. They won't let me go. They want me to keep doing this. And it's like, I pass his bike shop all the time on the way to school and think, who is this guy? What is he about? And so just talking to him a little bit gave us a little bit more information about him. And it, everybody's story is different. Yeah, and it's almost like therapy in a way for uh, the person that you talk to. Yeah. But then it turns out to be something even more therapeutic when you put it on Facebook. What's the story behind this person? This is the story I was sharing you about, um, about the lady with SIDS. This was the one oh. that I approached. So I just saw her feet, her shoes, and she was nice enough to talk to me for 10 minutes. And when we made the picture together, I asked her, you know, do you mind looking back at the camera? A lot of the times people will say, um, yeah, no problem, and they'll pose and they'll smile, but I really have to think about, well, what's your story? And so what about I asked these them to look back. So this one I was interviewing the mother and the daughter, and a typical question that I'll ask kids is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Just thinking, mm -hmm. where is this going to go? And this lady said, um, the little girl said, I want to be a doctor. So I said, well, um, what kind of doctor do you want to be? And she said, I want to be a surgeon so I can look inside people's bodies. <laughs> and usually kids don't get that specific. So yeah. I thought, wow. is there someone's body you want to look inside? And she said, yeah, my mom's body, which gave me the cue to say, keep questioning what's going on. Is there something you want to fix in your mom's body? And she looked at her mom and her mom said, it's okay, you can tell her. And she looked at me and she said, breast cancer. Aww. So you put that out there and it comes up as a story and a quote and it's a different way to talk about right. breast cancer. It's not a pink ribbon. It's not looking at football players' shoes. But it's like, yeah, who do I know with breast cancer? Do, do you have you standard know? questions you ask, or is it all sort of impromptu when, when you're right on the spot? Yeah, I have maybe five questions that are my go-tos in the beginning. What's your greatest struggle? What's the best and worst part of your week? Um, what are you most proud of? You know, what, what's the most bravest moment? Well, how do we find your site to, to check it out? Yeah, so it's on Facebook. Uh, you just look up Humans of St. Louis. We also have a, um, a website too, so humansofstl.org. Uh, we're on Instagram and Twitter. All right, it's a neat idea. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do hope you enjoyed this uh, episode with us. And Raina, yes. I just want to say thank you so much for <laughs> filling in for Debbie. It was fun today. It was. And fun I want to thank today. our guests and everybody for watching. I hope they join us next time. Thank you so much. Bye. See you. <laughs> so.